Bev and I went on a prayer walk together, and um, you, you ever you ever like praying the same thing kind of over and over again, and you kind of get tired of it a little bit? I'm, I'm being true. I'm just being transparent. Okay, you, am I the only person ever? You know, you, you walk by this one house, and you're you're praying for 1707, and then you come to 1713, and you're thinking, I'm saying the exact same thing, and I just want you to know that uh, uh, Bev and I were focusing on about seven different thoughts as we were praying. One thought was this, is that, um, so I would pray for a house, and then she'd pray for a house, and then me being a competitive person, I'd pray for two to her one, and, and, then, and then I'd go three to her two, and, uh, and anyway, we, we were asking that they would fall in love with Jesus. We were asking that they would deny themselves and take up their cross and follow the Lord. We were asking for them to humble themselves. We were asking for them to find their identity in Jesus Christ as a child of God, not simply somebody who would become a churchgoer. We were asking that God would draw them to him in a relationship with him and that they would love and cherish the idea of being a redeemed person and um, that, that they would see Christ in someone. One of the houses that we walked by, we happen to know it's a kid who's a believer. I say kid because he's about 29 years old. I'm, Dear God, may Jimmy make a difference in this neighborhood. May his love for you, may his little going to church make a little bit of a difference in this neighborhood. It was just kind of refreshing thinking that some people come to the Lord a little bit by osmosis because you grow up in the church. And other people come because of a drastic change of life, something that you and I would call a proselyte. It's, it's, a, it's a convert. I grew up in the church, but I'm a convert, okay? I went to church because I had to. I faked that I was sick several times, and all I got was the chance to stay in bed the rest of the day. I didn't have freedom that day. I had bondage to my bed. Um, and, and, but yet, I was taught that we were supposed to give an hour to God every week. And so I'm, I'm more of a convert. The cool thing was, after I came to Christ, about eight months later, I shared Christ with my mom, and, and she finally met Jesus Christ. She's bawling. She's going, I didn't know all this. I'm going, Mom, you're 57 years old. You've been to church a whole lot of times, and you don't understand that you need God's forgiveness, and you need to personally acknowledge his grace. She goes, no, I don't. Find out a couple of, you know, end out sharing this with my brother. My brother becomes a proselyte. He grew up in the church, and he... He, he goes, John, I didn't know any of that. I talked to my sister. My sister says, you're so stupid. And, and I said, well, I know I'm stupid, but what am I stupid about this time? And she said, didn't you remember going to those classes and they were talking about the importance of knowing God? And I says, Karen, I was staring out the window at the cars driving by, and I wasn't paying attention to what they were saying. I wasn't ready for it yet. There are some of us that grow up in the faith, and there are some of us that make an active firm decision at some point going, I didn't know any of that stuff. Um, and, and, and that really brings us to this idea of, of, of Ruth. Um, I, I, I want to share something with you. Okay, this, this is some Play-Doh. And uh, for the sake of it, we're going to, uh, we're just going to, we're just going to take a look at this for a second. I want you to know that right now, this is the shape of this Play-Doh. And and it has a tendency when you push it to go back to what it was. You know, you know what I mean by that? We have to, if I'm going to be the potter of some clay, if I'm going to be the player of some Play-Doh, I just made that up, okay? Um, then I have to train this to not be who it used to be. I have to begin to mold it into what it is that I want it to be. And I have to begin to shape it into something that I think is 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 what I want it to be and and the truth is, you and I, as believers, or you and I as people who aren't believers, we got to say, hey, I want to be dead to my old self. And I want to be shaped by Jesus Christ. I want to know the Lord of the universe. I want to know that holy God that we just referred to. And I don't want my past to define me. I want my current place in Jesus Christ to define me. I want to be defined by the potter. I want to be defined by him who has made everything. 
And that's really the story of Ruth. The story of Ruth is somebody who said this, I don't want to be a Moabite anymore. I want to be known as a follower of the Lord. I want to be known as somebody who has given my life to the Lord above everything else. And my identity is in a relationship with him. We started out this book last week, and I'm going to read to you this right now, Ruth chapter 1. If you've got a Bible and want to turn to Ruth chapter 1, uh, what an incredible story. As we talked last week, this story was read every single year. Why was it read every year? Because there was absolute joy and admiration over the fact that this is a transformed life. Starting in chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahan and Kelon. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem of Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. When Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she left with her two sons, she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. Shame on them. They married somebody outside of the faith. They dishonored a commandment that they'd been brought up with. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, and the other, Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. That's got to be a depressing thing. In a male-oriented society, three women are left there all alone. All alone. Their identity was shaken greatly. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where they had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. So they're on their way. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. Go back to a life of sin. Just enjoy the Moabite way of life. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of mother-in-law is this? But then she says something really interesting here. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back to your people. Isn't that so polite? <laughs> no, 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 we'll go with you. You ever notice how we're polite, and we're hoping to get let off the hook? Anybody ever done that before? You're polite, and you're like, no, no, I'll clean it up. And then they say, no, no, I'll take care of you. You give them one more plan. I say, no, I'd love to help you. And then they say back, no, don't worry about it. You're like, good. Am I the only one who's like that? Okay. Dave, thank you. I appreciate that. And then verse 11. But Naomi says, return home, my daughters. Why would you have come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, Naomi said, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. For where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, 
she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. How'd you like to be Ruth right then? <laughs> You're slamming me. I just told you I'm with you all the way. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. You know, every story on the face of the earth has a, uh, has a location. It has, a, uh, it has characters. It has a basic storyline. And the truth is, is that this, this story takes place in Bethlehem. And then Moab is about, about 50 miles kind of to the southeast of there. The priests of Moab were very powerful people. They were cruel. There was a wide assortment of God. One was known as the God of Chemish. And the God of Chemish was this huge altar. And on this huge altar was a little slide ramp of rocks. And you would... You would make infant sacrifice there, a child sacrifice there, and, and you would set the child there when they would slide into the burning flame. That's the type of people the Moabites were. They, 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 there was idols everywhere. In Psalm chapter 60, it says, Moab is my wash pot, because that's the place where they, people got rid of their, their life because that's where they went and spent their idolatry years, their years of worshiping false gods. Now, many things happened as a result of uh, Elimelech uh, arriving in this town and arriving in this area. The first one is this, is that um, some things that the family chose were cultural instead of biblical. These guys, they, they chose wives of, of, of another god. That's a cultural living. Here in America, one of our challenges is it's easy for us to choose culturally. <gasps> let's find the best house we can get. Let's find the most house we can afford and let's buy it. As opposed to saying, you know what? I'm here in my neighborhood and I'm walking my neighborhood because I want my neighborhood to know Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be the influencer instead of the influenced. I'm going to be the thermostat, and I'm going to change the temperature of my neighborhood. I'm not going to be a thermometer and measure the temperature. I'm going to change the temperature in my neighborhood. Now, the characters, there's this man, his name's Elimelech, and his name means my God is king. Now, why is that interesting? Because this story doesn't, play, play, this story doesn't take place when there was a king in Israel. Every time the name Elimelech is mentioned in this passage, every time it's mentioned in this book is a proclamation of the fact that God is the king and no one else is. Not any other person. To the Jews, the very name mentioning of Elimelech is a testimony to the power in the name of God and that you and I are determined to have him be our king. What's the basic storyline? The basic storyline, as we talked a little bit last week, is they leave the house of bread of Bethlehem, and they arrive in Moab. What did they go there for? They went there because of a famine. Naomi didn't know. Elimelech didn't know that their future daughter-in-law was going to have a place in the story of the birth of the Savior. What they were running from brought them to an incredible missionary journey. You ever run from something you realize, oh, I'm here now and I don't know what to do? <laughs> praise God that he was there before you. And praise God that he can do something there with you. Elimelech dies. That leaves Naomi without a certain amount of hope. That her provisions are gone. The two boys get married. 
they probably don't have very unified homes because of the uh, religious backgrounds there. They die. Naomi loses some more hope because the sons are gone. Ten years goes by and a, they, they finally decide that, uh, hey, death is real and we're going back because they've heard something positive from the house of bread, the barley harvest. There's a couple of great lessons here for us, and the first one is this. There's a covenant promise that God made to us. There's a covenant promise that God made to us. The Lord has come to the aid of his people. You and I are to be God-fearing people. You and I are to be acknowledging God's presence. The focus is not on smarter farming techniques. The focus here was that Naomi heard, Naomi heard what the Lord had done. They didn't come up with better roundup. They didn't come up with tractors. It wasn't what humanly had happened. It's what God had done. God had restored things there. In verse 6, the Lord had come to the aid of his people. God is seen as the one who is fulfilling his covenant. And I guess the question for you and I is this. Do we acknowledge the work of God or do we acknowledge the work of our hands? I mean, you ought to see my garden. You ought to see my living room after I vacuum it. You ought to see the bathroom after Bev cleans it. You ought to see the house after the grandkids leave and we've cleaned it. No, no, no. This is what the Lord has done. Here's a second thought. It comes from verse 7 and 8. We need to stand on the promises of God. A lot of times, a lot of times you know how we check our security? <laughs> Did I lose my credit card? Oh, oh no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Sometimes our security is found in, oh, do you know where the keys to my car is? Nowadays, you know where our security really is found? Have I lost my phone? Oh, God. Everything in the whole world is in there. How many of you would rather lose your phone than your wallet? Depends on if you have a flip phone or not, right? Um, the truth is this. They were standing on the promises of God. In verse 8, this is what is said. Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to, the, as you have shown to, your, to your dead. May the Lord grant each of you to find rest in another husband. Human reasoning there says this. I'm only somebody if I'm married in the land of Moab. My identity is in my husband. Go back to your gods is what she says. Yes, they're probably very hard workers, but do they love the Lord? Do they love human provision? Have they sought the Lord above everything else? Where's their heart? Where are their desires? And then this politeness kicks in. You and I need to be more than polite. There are churches all over the world with polite people that do not depend upon the hand of God. They depend on something else. There are many polite people in the world that are just, they're counting on their smile rather than their words. They're counting on their presence rather than the presence of God. What does she stay in verse 10? She said, we will stay. The girls say, we will stay with you. They're gracious and they're kind. We're kind sometimes. We say, no, we don't want any seconds. What we really want to do is really want to be pleaded so we can have thirds. The girls are polite. Then Naomi is polite back. But then there's a reveal of who they are. The reveal of who they are starts in verses 12 and 13. There's this human reasoning that takes place from Naomi. Well, you don't really want to wait around for the next 18 years while I get a son, do you? I'm old. I probably can't even find somebody to marry anyway. And if I do, would I even be capable of having a baby? All the human reasoning things, that's polite. That's polite. She shows and feels the inability to provide for her daughters-in-law. Then there's Oprah, Orpha, however you say her name. 
I've said Oprah so many times, okay? You know what? She longs for the old life. And she goes back. She wants the old lifestyle. She wanted to be with her people. She wanted to be with her gods. Her love for Ruth and her love for God was like a veneer finish. You know what a veneer finish is? A veneer finish is like about a, about a 30 second of an inch deep on some particle board that is about two inches thick. She has this veneer for God. She's like the seed planted on the rocky soil. It sprouted and then it's gone. But here's Ruth. Ruth is that piece of pottery that wants to be shaped. And she says, I want to be a part of the family of God. I want to find an identity in the Lord. I want to be a believer. And I'm going to be a part of the family of God. And I'm giving my life to him. And where God is is where I am. And where the family of God is is where I want to be. I want to join you. I want to walk with you. I want to walk in the ways of the covenant of the Lord. I want to follow God's ways. And she was claiming the very God that Naomi was claiming. Culturally, Ruth had no loopholes, no escape routes out of the family. She had fallen in love with Yahweh, the law of God. In America, we often choose the, that easy way. You ever switch jobs because it's tough? Or do you say, God, maybe you want somebody here who's a stronghold? I had a job once, and um, <clears throat> every human reason I should have said I quit. Every human reason. I had eight and a half pages typed of why I should leave. But you know what? The very first thought was this. God, I believe that you have called me to be in this place. And during that short time period, I watched a couple people get fired for the stupid reasons. I was aging that year, and Bev said to me about halfway through that year, she said, John, she goes, you're, you're growing old. She goes, but I believe that God asked you to be there. Some time went by, and I finally realized that it was time for me to go, too, and I said it was time for me to go. And the next week, Bev says, hey, there's John. He says, you've been a tool of God for the last eight and a half months, but, but John's right there. John, you just became 10 years younger in the last, like, couple of weeks. The truth is, is that, is that, is that, is that, God didn't want me to leave there. He had, a, he had a role for me there. But here's the, here's the key word in this entire passage. And it's the word I'd like you to bank on. In verse 18, it says this, she determined in her heart not to leave. Are you determined to follow the Lord the rest of your life? Are you determined to turn everything over to him? If she were giving her faith story, she would say, well, I grew up in Moab and I did all this stuff and I got married. But on this one day, on this road back to Bethlehem, I determined that day to give my life to the Lord and give him everything that I have. And it was there that I met the Lord. For me, I met the Lord on June 25th, 1977, sitting in a pew at a camp, heard the message. It had probably been shared many times before, but Mr. ADD here, <laughs> I didn't ever hear it because my hands were moving too fast to watch my eyes to be like distracted constantly. She was a convert. She's a proselyte. She became a believer. She chose for herself. If she were giving her faith story, that would be her moment in time that she met Jesus Christ. It was a day that she decided to turn away from her old lifestyle, to resolve in her heart to turn away from the things of this world. 
in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, it speaks of what took place, where it says that, where Jesus is talking and he says to the people, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. She decided to follow the Lord at that point in time. Whereas Orpha was like Lot's wife, she longed for the old life. She longed for the old life. Ruth is saying, no, I want a new life. I want the joy and satisfaction of knowing the Lord. In Joshua chapter 28, chapter, sorry, Joshua chapter 24, there's not 28 chapters in Joshua, okay? The Amorites and uh, other groups are gathered together. And Joshua speaks these words. And these are the words I'd like us to hear today. Starting in verse 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the god of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then they proclaim their own determined right here. Then the people answered Joshua, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove us before all of our nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. So let me ask you a question. Have you chosen to know the Lord? And did you choose again today to get to know him better? And are you going to choose again tomorrow to, to serve him better and to grow in him? Most of you know this. We have two daughters, and uh, we, we, we prayed. We prayed earnestly that our daughters would make a decision for themselves. And I always said this. When my daughters turn 30, that's when I'll tell you if they love the Lord. Somebody says, what do you mean? I says, hey, I believe them, but I don't want that. I know it's also kids like to make parents happy, right? <laughs> At least ours tried to, okay? Um. And, and I always said, when they turn 30, that's when I'll know. Because they don't have to make me happy anymore. I will know when they turn 30 if they've made a full commitment completely of their own to love the Lord Jesus Christ. They're both 30, and I would say this, that they have every desire in their heart to follow and love the Lord. The point is this, they determined in their heart. Listen to these words again. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. I will die and die. She made a choice to be part of the family of God. She made a choice to give her life in full service to the Lord. We're going to discover that more in the next couple of weeks. Where it says you will die means this. She understands that we will continue to live the way that God wants us to. And when death separates us, that's just for a time. Because then I'm going to join up with you in heaven. You know what? I presented to you some clay a little bit ago. But you know what? I decided I wanted this to be a donut. If you don't know, I love donuts. My favorite one is the one in my hand getting ready to touch my teeth. It doesn't even have to be that good. But you see, I, I, I decided I wanted this to be a donut. And so I got to keep working it. And I got to keep saying to myself, Lord, keep forming me. 
you are the potter and I am the clay. And I simply want to see myself as identified as a child of God. I want to determine in my heart more than anything else in all the world that I would be a follower of you. One of our most important priorities of a church is that, uh, is that people would know the Lord, that they would meet the Lord. I hope you know without a shadow of a doubt that you have met the Lord Jesus Christ face to face and that you have determined in your heart. I'd ask you for a favor this week. Would you send me an email or send me a text that just says, John, I met God here. John, I, I met God at a camp. I met God in my living room. I, I met God going to a confirmation class, and I believed the whole thing right then. Lord, I have determined in my heart. Because one of the great testimonies that we have is this. When we've determined that, that solves the issue of whether or not I'm going to go on a prayer walk. Because I want other people to know that too. I just hope some of me bubbles out as I walk by that house. So I didn't tell you this part. We're praying for this house, and, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family who we've never met, but there was a big fire there a couple years ago. And the lady walks outside, and I said, hi. And she walks over the fence. Hi, how are you guys? Are you going to buy that house down the street? We got into a little conversation, and I tried to use the phrase, um, Tried to, tr tried to jump in with the, the words of the Lord. It wasn't happening yet, but I thought, we built, we began to build a bridge with this little lady, with her family. And we're hoping that we can see them determining in their hearts someday to know the Lord Jesus as well. Let's pray together.